So I would like to begin with a quote from uh, Signs of the Times, November 28, 1900. It says, let us show the people where we are in prophetic history and seek to arouse the spirit of true Protestantism, awaking the world to a sense of the value of the religious liberty they have so long enjoyed. Today I'm going to speak about prophetic history. I'm going to show you where we are actually headed. And I would like to begin our presentation with, this, with a fascinating quote from the book Education. Now, I read this quote a couple of years ago, and still to this day, as I read this quote, it just baffles my mind. R listen to this. She says, at the same time, anarchy is seeking to sweep away all law, not only divine, but of human. The centralizing of wealth and power, do we see that today? Do you think the person knows what is happening? The centralizing of wealth and power, the vast combinations for the enriching of the few at the expense of the many. Is that happening? Whoa. The combination of the poorer classes for the defense of their interest and claims. Is that happening? Hmm. Now listen to this. The spirit of unrest, the spirit of riot, and the spirit of bloodshed, the worldwide dissemination of the same teachings that led to the French Revolution, all are tending to involve the whole world in a struggle similar to that which convulsed France. Now, I don't know if you got the idea what the, what the author is trying to present, but it's huge. And even though the author, who is Ellen White, this author lived in the 18th or 19th century with, a prophetic, with the prophetic gift that she had received, with the prophetic eyes, is looking into the future and do not tell me if these things are not in our world as they are now. And especially the spirit of unrest, the spirit of riot, and the spirit of bloodshed is what is taking place, including in Europe. Now, Europe was a couple of decades ago a, a kind of peaceful uh, continent, but you wouldn't think of Europe in that way today. Now, this is what people today are thinking about. This is what people today are struggling with. Now, Christina Lagarde, who is the executive director of International Monetary Fund, she fears the advent of an age of anger. Now, if there is a word that you can uh, sort of uh, tell what politics is about, it's anger today. It's not goodwill that drives politics and the force of politics, but it's anger. And it's both sides. Both politicians, whether it's on the right or on the left, they are playing into the fears of human beings. And you know, we could talk for this for hours, and she fears an age of anger. My question is, has that age of anger come? I believe that we are actually seeing the beginnings of this age of anger. Now, do you think that when people are angry that they are making logical uh, decision making? Not at all. So in this age of anger, do you think that the politicians are going to make logical conclusions of very complex issues? Probably not. And you know, whether it's the people in the Yellow Wests that are doing all kinds of unrest and, and rioting in France, listen to this from Associated Press, in democracies, political chaos, new model emerges. I wonder what that model is. Could it be that that model, that order, if we can call that, which has been in Europe, which has been the foundation for Western civilization and society for decades and decades, that that is actually 
disappearing and that a new order is actually coming about. So here you have the Yellow West, but it's whether we are talking about France or we are talking about Sweden, we are talking about Hungary, there is a political revolution taking place right before our very eyes, and I believe that it is prophetic. From Foreign Affairs, the author says, and this is coming out in March, April, so you and I are able to get an insight into an article that has not yet been published in the newspaper, okay? The title is, The Future of the Liberal Order is what? Conservative. Conservative? Politically conservative, but also religiously conservative. You know how it is with the pendulum swinging back and forth. Back and forth. There is one generation that goes to one extreme, and when that group has gone too extreme, then the pendulum is swinging back. But you know what is one common denominator of humanity? Is that we are not, we are extreme. Human nature is extreme in and of itself. And so what happens is, is that whether you are liberal or conservative, it can always go to the other extreme. The author says, a liberal word order is in peril. 75 years after the United States helped found it, this global system is under attack. And the order is clearly worth saving, but the question is how? Could it be that we are actually seeing a political revolution before our very eyes where this world order is coming about but in, a, in another kind of fashion which you and I even thought of? Do you think of someone who is leading this political revolution? Do you think of any conservative or at least on the paper conservative political figure who is leading the march of defeating the liberal world order. I know you have a couple of names in your head. Instability and populist unrest is the new world order. I'm quoting to you from the Washington Post. Is the new world order actually not what we have been thinking of so long that, that there will be some kind of world government? But instead that these certain countries will somehow cooperate themselves in bringing about what we have been thinking of as the end time event and that it is populist unrest. It's the age of anger that drives the political decision making towards it forward. I know that was the person whom you probably thought of, who is the leader of this new system that is actually developing upon ourselves. And you know what? Many people who are Bible prophecy students do not recognize that we are living in per perilous times. We are living in perilous times because the pendulum is shifting. The pendulum is shifting to a place where a world order will likely arise only from calamity. Are we truly going in that direction? And I thought it was interesting that Secretary of State Pompeo said, Trump is building a new liberal world order. Very interesting that if you have listened to one of my sermons on YouTube, you will recognize that I have spoken a lot about Trump. And Trump, interestingly enough, has this sort of conservative, conservative values which he brings into his politics. But it's not only political, it's also religious. Because what he is backed up by is the religious right in the United States. And the religious right is influencing him to make certain kinds of decisions. And you know, it's not only Trump. All over Europe, all over the Western world, Trump-like characters, Trump-like politicians, Trump-like leaders are arising and instead of following the liberal path, they are now sort of wanting to come back to the conservative values. And I wonder if that is not more true in interpretation of our understanding 
of end time events. You know what is also one common denominator of these sort of leaders coming up? Is that they are backed by Christian leaders. Whether that's Trump, whether that's certain leaders here in Europe, or whether that is the president of Brazil. The president of Brazil is also claimed to be a Trump-like character. So there is a political revolution taking place right before our very eyes. And I find this to be remarkable. But it's not only the US, even Great Britain is struggling with what kind of path are we going to take. Brexit is the first test of a new global order. We can jump over that. So people, when they, when they see politics, they recognize that something is wrong. Have you ever talked to someone about politics? You come to re realize that people are asking for answers of the questions they have. Is this it? Is this it? But whether you can also take a look at and the, 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 the news that I'm presenting to you, it's all coming from 2018, 2019. So this is fresh material. A Russian court sent Jehovah's Witness to prison for six years. You see, for a couple, a couple of years ago, the Russian Federation had decided that the Jehovah's Witnesses as a religious organization is an extremist organization. Just out of the blue. They decided that they are an extremist organization. And this is the first time when the leader of that certain religious group is now a prisoner because he believes in something that the majority don't believe in. Do you think that there is a revolution, there is a shake-up in our world? And you know, I believe that this is a type. This is a type of what will happen to everyone who dares to go, not along, but against the very system. And Switzerland votes overwhelmingly to jail citizens for homophobia, transphobia. In other words, even if you dare to question the ideology which is behind these certain propagations, certain countries have now decided that they, you can go to jail just because you do not go along the mentality, the group thinking. Do you think that people are asking questions? People who are of logic, people who, who want to know the truth? I believe they really do. And so whether that is politics, whether that is uh, freedom and freedom of religion, whether that is climate change. We read that we have 12 years to limit climate change catastrophe, warns United Nations. And so they are thinking about 2013 as being a sort of a goal in which we have to reach certain uh, developmental goals. And so it is the age of anger, but it's also the age of, of, of where people are making decisions because of they are afraid. Do you think it's some, something could go wrong? And you know, I find it interesting that climate change activists vow to set up protests around the world. They will, what is the word? Yes. To act after lack of process. You see, in an age of anger, something is not going according to your way, you force. Is that what Revelation 13 says? As the image of the beast is being set up, what is the image of the beast doing? It causes, the King James Bible says, it forces those who do not go along to be persecuted and so on. We are living in fascinating times and people want answers they want solutions. And so in this age where climate change is occurring, and I just want to tell you that this, this, this weather is not normal. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, up in Ostrobothnia, we had minus 30 degrees Celsius. And now we have plus five. <laughs> Something is strange. And people notice that. And they are asking questions. Question is, were we able to give them solutions? Will we be able to give them explanations? An explanation 
which comes from scripture. And that's, that's why the world desperately needs an environmental leader. So can you see that there are so many problems, political problems, religious problems, there are environmental problems, there are economic problems, and people are searching for a green messiah. At least that's what they call for it. And people are calling for a world parliament, 2018. In order to create global solutions, we need a global political body that can facilitate the global democratic discussions and take global decisions. Do you have prophecy in your mind? Can you see how we are step by step by step coming closer and closer to what we have been actually saying? This was from a speech, 2018, Parliament of World Religions in Toronto. And listen to what one of the keynote speakers said. We, the people of the world, need to unite and demand a world government and a world parliament based on Earth constitution. Now let me ask you, who do you think the leader will be? Because if there will be a group of people gathering together to make decisions, obviously there needs to be someone who leads that. And what is that Earth constitution? That is what I want to talk to you today. So with this longer introduction, I want you to see where, what, what people are asking, what are the problems people are facing, what is ahead of us, and how does that go together with Bible prophecy. So if you have your Bibles, go with me to Revelation chapter 13. We're not going to have a long Bible study on this. We're just going to read through some, I think, very familiar passages. Revelation chapter 13, and I'm reading... In verses 1 to 3. Revelation 13, verses 1 to 3, the Bible says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. You see, in Bible prophecy, if we interpret the Bible according to the Bible, in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, we are told that a beast is, sim is symbolic of a nation or a political, uh, uh, political country. So here we see a political land, a political country being introduced here. And what is so fascinating is that on his head, on his head, there is a blasphemous name. Now... In the Old Testament, did you know that the high priest who was serving the Lord was supposed to have a hat on which there was a name, sanctified unto the Lord. This system, who has a leader, also has what? A name. But it's a blasphemous name. And you see, this blasphemous name is more explained in the book of Revelation chapter 17 where we are introduced to a woman who sits upon a scarlet colored beast. It's the same power. And this religious system, because in Bible prophecy a woman is a church or a group of people. And this church or is this group of people, it says there that she had a name on her forehead and it was... Babylon the Great, the harlot of all. So this power is not only a political power, it is a religious power. We could say that it is claiming to be a high priest on, heaven, on earth, but Jesus is our high priest because Paul says there is how many mediators between God and man? One. One. So blasphemous in the Bible there are two definitions of blasphemy the first definition of blasphemy is that he, someone who claims to be God that's the first and the second is someone who can forgive 
someone's sins. These are the two definitions in scripture. So here we have a political power which is also religious. Do you follow me so far? Verse 2 says, Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. Now you know what is interesting with a leopard? If we would have time, we would go to uh, the book of Jeremiah where we would be able to see that a leopard cannot change its spots. So this power is described as a leopard because it's, it is a power that will not change. Amen. Which I believe is really, really amazing. And this world needs to hear this message because people think that this power that we are talking about right now has changed. But oh boy, if they would know. Oh boy, if they would know what is actually happening. It's a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. He is devouring. The dragon gave him his power, his throne and his great authority. Those of you who are Bible prophecy students, the symbolism of a leopard, a bear and a lion, where does it come from? The book of Daniel chapter 7. Now what is remarkable is that in the book of Daniel chapter 7, it is the other way around, the, lion, the, the animals are being described. What is it that Daniel sees first? A lion, which symbolizes Babylon. And then he sees a bear, symbolizes Medo-Persia. Then he sees a leopard, which symbolizes ancient Greece. And then he sees an animal he cannot describe. And that symbolizes pa pagan Rome. And it is out of that pagan Rome who will give its power, seat, and authority to that little horn, that religious power who we are talking about, that will come about. And in verse 3, we are told the following, that, and I saw one of his heads as it was wounded, mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. As Seventh-day Adventists, we have taught that this prophecy, that it had received a mortal wound, that the papacy received this mortal wound in 1798, when the, when the French general Berthier was sent by Napoleon to take the Pope captive. And in verse 10, in Revelation 13, that's what is described. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who is killed with the sword will be killed by the sword. So here you see that this is exactly what happened to this power. God said that it would be taken into captivity and it was taken indeed into captivity. But the Bible says that although this power was taken into captivity and in the whole 19th century, including the beginning of the 20th century, this power is without any political power. What does it say in verse 3? That deadly wound was healed. And how much of the world marveled and followed the beast? All the world. Isn't that scary? All the world marveled and followed the beast. You see... You read books like The Great Controversy. You read books of the pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we must recognize, my friends, to understand the context in which they are coming from. In the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, the papacy whom we are here talking about does not have any political power. Yet they are claiming, what I'm going to read to you soon, that the whole world, will wander after the beast. How do you think the people must have reacted when they said these things? You guys must, must be a little bit... You must get, guys have a problem. You guys are conspiracy theorists. The whole world wandered after the beast? You know what it tells me? If the beast is the papacy, and here, my brothers and sisters, we are not talking about certain individuals in the system, all right? We are talking about a system which, according to Scripture, has fallen away. It has ended up in apostasy. However, 
it tells me that if, if the whole world will wander after the beast, and it is going to say, as we read in Revelation chapter 13, that it will cause the world to worship, what will be the biggest uh, issue in the end times? Worship. And worship is about spirituality. It's about religion, my friends. Religion is not going away from our society. Religion will be even more important than ever before. And so with that, listen to this. This man is one of the, not, 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 not the founders, but he's one of the leading experts in the area of climate change. Now listen to this. This leader who is not a Christian, he's, not an, he's an atheist. He says the ecological revolution will be? Whoa. What is he saying? What role should spirituality play in the ecological field? That's the question of the interviewer. And he goes on and says that our world is just doing all kinds of things. But he says, I see only one possible way out of the problem, a spiritual revolution. Spiritual revolution. He asks the question, what do you mean by spiritual revolution? Well, it's a revolution that is done by recalling ethical moral values by practicing humanism. So in other words, you bring back morality, and if you want to have morality, you have to bring back a law, because a law is what defines what is good and what is bad. Interesting. But it is practicing humanism. Who is the center? God or man? Man. So whatever the solutions, whatever the moral values that will come back, it will be centered upon man and not God. So the, whatever the law will be, is not the law of God. Listen to this. This path is supported by great spiritual figures, including the Pope. Today we see that there is a renewal of religions because we are a bit lost in the materialistic world. That I can agree with. We need basic values that are supported by which Christianity? Which brand of Christianity? Probably the one led by the papacy. This is one of the leaders of the ecological revolution, the climate change thinkers, who says that the way forward is not scientific, but it's spiritual. Do you think that someone could easily use this situation to his or her Power. Listen to this. This is Ellen White, living in the 19th century, a time when the papacy did not have any political power. And she says, the world is filled with storm and war, war and variance. Yet under how many heads? One. One. The papal power, the people will unite to oppose God in the person of of his witnesses. So the world will wander after the beast. And she says it is the papal power written in the 19th century. Do you think that this author knew what she was talking about? Do you think that that prophetic gift held her to look into the future and see where things would go? Listen to this. Signs of the Times, 1898. This is exactly 100 years after 1798. And the author says, in a time when Romanism and the papacy does not have any political power, listen to this, the Roman church is far reaching in her plans and modes of operation. You know why? Because the papacy thinks in 50 years, in 100 years, in 150 years. We think maybe in one year, or maximum five years. But this is a system that has existed for almost 2,000 years. It has far-reaching plans. She's employing how many devices? Every device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict to do what? 
regain the control of the world. I did not say that. The prophet said that. The prophet was a conspiracy theorist, according to some people. Yet, we are clearly told that it's about using every device to regain the control of the world, to reestablish persecution, and to undo all that Protestantism has done. Are we in that? Do we see the developments of the world telling us that this is where we are headed? My friends, 1898. If someone would write it today, then I would understand that. But in 1898, to claim that the papacy would come back and now on a global scale reign, that's pretty remarkable. So Gallup has made a lot of surveys and they discover that Pope Francis is the world's best leader. Do you see a Bible verse just echoing in your mind that the whole world will wonder after the beast. I mean, I don't have any personal problem with Pope Francis. I would love to meet him. But the question is, do we recognize the seriousness of the times that we are living in? We can jump over this and we read in the great controversy when the leading churches of the United States uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, ecumenism, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy when church and state comes together. And the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. Three things to quickly comment. Let us broaden this definition. And you see, the times that we are living in today is more complex because there are other religions to be included in this new world order or whatever you have to have. But this concept of having things in common, that is what still guides interreligious, interfaith dialogues. So in, as, as, as I'm now soon going to come to, as I have now laid a really good foundation, I believe, for the, how Islam and every, everything else is coming into this, what is it that I'm against? What is it that we are against? Now, it could be because of my Swedish background. It could be because of my own, uh, you know, in Sweden, people are not that religious. People are usually suspicious of, of religion. And maybe I have that. And frankly, I'm unhappy for that. <laughs> but here's the thing. Whenever religion and the government combines and comes together, you know that you have a problem because history is on your side. History shows that whenever state and church has united, what has been the consequence? The infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. However good, however idealistic, however beautiful the solutions people will come up with. But if it's state and church and state that comes together, you know that if you, if, if you uh, dare to think differently, you will be punished. You will be indeed punished. And that's my question. Are we headed towards that direction? The great controversy says on page 588, papists, protestants, and worldlings. Worldlings. Do you think that we could put Muslims in the worldling category? I believe so. So protestants, Papist, Protestants, and anyone else <laughs> will alike accept the form of godliness without the power, and listen to this, they will see in this, what? Union, a grand movement for the conversion of the world and the ushering in of the long-expected millennium. We can save the world. We can save the planet. And they're going to come with certain spiritual solutions. And my question is, is that what will change and save the world? And what happens to those people who do not want to go along this union 
of a grand movement. So let me now quickly take you to Pope Francis' visit to uh, the Middle East. Now, he is going to visit the Middle East twice. He has already visited um, the United Arab Emirates. That was in 2000, uh, that was in uh, February 2019. But he is going to visit Morocco. Morocco. And listen to how he is portrayed as. He is the servant of hope. In an age of anger, do you remember? Someone is coming with hope. Question is, is it true hope or false hope? Do you know what the Bible says in Daniel chapter 8 about the Roman papacy? It says, by peace it shall destroy many. I'm going to come back to this word, peace. So put that on your mind. Do you see anything particularly interesting with this logo? Do you see a half moon? And do you see the cross? Is this Chrislam? The unity of Islam and the papacy in order to bring about political changes in the world? Friends, I'm not the one who says that. You go and visit Vatican VA. Everything that I'm going to show you now comes from the official website of the Vatican. And they themselves say, an explanatory note accompanying the logo's release says that a cross and a crescent in the logo are symbols of Christianity and Islam, which highlight the inter-religious relations between Christians and Muslims. So somehow, these two, I mean, Catholics are one point something billion. Muslims are one point something billion. So here you have Two, more than two billion people who are now sort of coming together. One third or one fourth of the world's population. Pope Francis says Christianity, Christian unity is not optional. It's not another choice. You must go along or else. And he says... Pope Francis said to world's religious leaders, we build the future together or there will be no future. But on whose conditions are you building the world? Whose conditions? His conditions. His solutions. And so this was a historic visit when the Pope visited the United Arab Emirates. This was the first Pope to visit the Arabian Peninsula, and he visited the heartland of the Muslim world. And you know, whenever I do research, I ask the Lord to guide me. Whenever I do research, I say, Lord, bring me to news articles, lead me to clips, lead me to links that I may see the full picture. Why visit the Arabian Peninsula at this year in this very time? I said, Lord, why? There must be something more than this. And so God led me to these articles. This uh, archbishop notes that Sheikh Tayyip has the leading role in both events and that Francis' visit to the United Arab Emirates takes place on the 800th anniversary of the meetings of St. Francis and Sultan Kamil. Yeah. I said, aha, this has now given me an opportunity to continue to see what was it that happened exactly 800 years ago. Now you see, Pope Francis has been inspired by Saint Francis. Saint Francis is the saint of creation. And that's why Pope Francis is also doing uh, a lot of, uh, you know, he wants to take care of the creation or the world. At, at, at least that's what the media is telling us. And so, St. Francis, if you study the life of St. Francis, you are going to see the steps this current Pope is going to take. So what happened 800 years ago? Here you see an icon, St. Francis uh, visiting uh, Sultan Kamil. 
And it was in 1219, exactly 800 years ago. And that was the time of the fifth, what? Crusade. So there is a crusade taking place between then Christianity and then Islam. And now, St. Francis' desire was to speak peacefully with Muslim people. Do you think about our world now? With Muslim people about Christianity, even if it means dying as a martyr. He tried to stop the crusaders from attacking the Muslims, but he failed. And so he was taken to Sultan al-Kamil. And Kamil was known as a kind and generous fair ruler. And his goal was to establish peaceful coexistence with Christians. And so they uh, met and they talked and they were discussing prayer and mystical life. And when Francis left, Al-Kamil gave him an ivory trumpet, which is still preserved to this very day. And there is no other path to peace in this bloody 21st century. So is there a crusade today in the 21st century? Are the relations between Christianity and Islam peaceful or not? It's everything but peaceful. My brothers and sisters, I want to tell you that history is repeating itself again. We are now living in a crusade. And now, not Saint Francis, but Pope Francis has come as an instrument of mediation, has now come as an instrument of peace to the leading, uh, to the leaders of the Islamic world to bring about <coughs> peace. What do you think about that? My brothers and sisters, this is remarkable because it just tells me once again that the whole world will wander after the papacy. And so Saint Francis traveled to Egypt during the Crusades. And what is it that Pope Francis wants to do? He wants to have all people of all different religions cooperating at the human level with regard to human problems. So we're going to jump over this. And now we're going to take a look at this historic pledge of fraternity. This historic pledge of brotherhood, which they call. So here they were. They signed the document. They gave each other a hug. They gave each other a kiss. And now let me tell you to the, to, uh, take you to the apostolic journey of Pope Francis to the United Arab Emirates. This is the logo that was used for the trip. What does it remind you of? What is the animal? It's a dove. Yes. And what does it have? Very good. What does the story tell you? Where in the Bible can you read about this? In the story of the flood. Where God was using that bird as a, as a tie or as a symbol of that there is now peace. That I'm going to make a covenant with humanity again. That I will not destroy them. And I'm not the one who makes this up. It comes from Vatican.va. Pope says we are here to desire peace, promote peace, and to be instruments of peace. What did Daniel 8 says? By peace it shall destroy many. Now I'm going to show you soon what they mean by the word peace. Because you have a different understanding of what peace is than what they do have. So put that on your mind. And so the logo of this journey depicts a dove with an olive branch. It is an image that recalls the story about the flood. According to the biblical account, in order to preserve humanity from destruction, God asked Noah to enter the ark along with his family. Today, we too, in the name of God, in order to safeguard peace, 
need to enter together as one family. Who is going to be Noah? Do you see the imagery, the symbols that they are trying to cast? That we as one big human family must be led by Noah to, to the ark in which can sail the stormy seas of the world, the ark of brotherhood. Now what happens to those who do not want to accept these antitypical Noah? What happens to those who do not see the papacy as the way they themselves do? Are they able to also come into the ark? Can we provide inclusiveness even to those who do not see things as they do? Can we provide tolerance to those who, see, who think otherwise? I don't think so. They are not welcome on the boat. They are not welcome into this ark of brotherhood. And so, uh, I, as, as I said, I'm, I'm reading these documents. I said, Lord, please guide me to put this thing together. And, and God led me to... Uh, you know, the Pope has uh, press releases and so on, and there are a lot of journalists there, and so the, one of the journalists asked the following questions to the Pope, that some Catholics accuse you of allowing yourself to be exploited by Muslims. Very good questions. What did the Pope answer? But not only by Muslims, they accuse me of letting myself to be exploited by everyone, even by journalists. Of course, he's trying to be humorous. But then he says, but there is one thing, yes, I would like to say. I openly reaffirm this. Check this out. From the Catholic point of view, the document which they signed does not move one millimeter away from the Second Vatican Council. Now, the Second Vatican Council is an infallible council. Can I come back to that? The document was crafted in the spirit of Second Vatican Council. Now you see, when I read these documents, this is music to my ears. Because I did my masteral dissertation on Roman Catholic ecumenism. And my masteral dissertation was about how is modern Roman Catholic ecumenism in the light of Second Vatican Council, Pope Benedict XVI, and Pope Francis I. And so I have read through all of these documents. And I recognize the buzzwords, I recognize the definitions that are using, which to people on the outside start, uh, sounds good, but if you have understood their mental thinking, you recognize that these are key words for something else. So can I show you? Because what, what the document is going to present it's in the spirit of Second Vatican Council. What did the Second Vatican Council decide? Now, the Second Vatican Council was between 1962 to 1965, so more than 50 years ago. And this is what the, they said. So, dignitatis humanitae, point 13. The church is a spiritual authority established by Christ upon which there rests a what kind of mandate? Divine. The duty of going out into the whole world and preaching the gospel to every creature. You say, Sebastian, what's wrong with that? Now that's where your Protestantism comes in. Comes in. You see, we read these documents and we read not through their lenses, but we read Oh, so preaching the gospel, in their case, not on the seventh day Sabbath, but on Sunday. Well, what's wrong with preaching and even holding some mass on Sunday? That's not Catholic thinking. Catholic thinking, when it comes to preaching the gospel, includes more than just preaching the word. Can I show you? Christ's redemptive work while essentially concerned with the salvation of man, includes also the renewal of the whole temporal order. So now we are not in the business of religion anymore. We are now in the business of 
politics. That's what Catholic thinking is about preaching the gospel. Not only the salvation of man, but it's the renewal of the whole temporal order, which is the political world. You see, this uh, idea of the whole temporal order, which the Second Vatican Council uses, it goes directly back to a historical figure, which I believe most of you have heard of. It's the Church Father Augustine. If you want to understand the Second Vatican Council and why the Catholic Church is like it is, a theocracy, to think about it, it's a theocracy, you have to understand Augustine, especially his book, Citita Dei, The City of God. And in his book, Augustine says that there are two cities and there are two orders. There is the city of the world, which belongs to leaders, politicians, the citizens of this world. And then there is a second city, that's the city of God. And that's what the church is. But he says these two cities must coexist and they must combine their efforts together to create, listen to me very carefully, peace and justice. The city of God is to rule over the city of the world, and as that coexistence takes place, it is in that case, society in this part is experiencing peace and justice. He calls it Pax Justitia, peace and justice. Why is it important? The Second Vatican Council said, we must establish a political, social, and economic order which will growingly serve who? Man. Man. What did that ecological thinker say? We must have moral and ethical values and practicing humanism. It's all in the spirit of the Second Vatican Council. Do you think that a political, social, and economic order is established right before your very eyes? I believe so. And take a look at this. Gaudium et Spes, point 74. It says the following. Men, families, and the various groups which make up the civil community are aware that they cannot achieve a truly human life by their own unaided efforts. Just to unpack this phrase would take a whole lecture. So I'm not even going to go into that. They see the need for a wider community within which, by the way, a truly human life, according to Catholic thinking, cannot happen without Sunday. That's why I say it's a whole lecture. They see the need for a wider community within which each one makes his specific contribution every day toward an even broader realization of the common good. Not the individual, it's the common good. So the political community exists consequently for the sake of the common good and that's what we must embrace. And now it comes. The definition of peace Remember what they want to create? It's the dove that comes as an instrument of peace and that whole human family must come into the ark of brotherhood led by Noah, whom Pope says is him. So what is that peace, Second Vatican Council? Peace is not merely the absence of war nor can it be reduced solely to the maintenance of balance of power. Instead, it is rightly and appropriately called an enterprise of justice. Here we have peace and justice. What is justice according to Roman Catholic theology? Pope Benedict XVI says it's the Ten Commandments. Fascinating. He says, P 
peace results from that order structured into human society by its divine founder and actualized by men as they thirst ever greater justice. Now listen to this. The common good of humanity finds its ultimate meaning in the eternal law. So do you want to have peace? What do you need to have? The eternal law. Whose law? The law of God or what the little horn has seek to change times and laws. Friends, peace according to an interfaith, interreligious Catholic mindset happens when the common good finds its ultimate meaning in the eternal law, in the Sunday observance, if I had time to show you this. And so that's what Pope Francis said. We must grow together. We must work together. And we must be willing on to take on everyone's problems, which are the problems of each person in the global village. So he says, Islam, Catholicism, we must work together to accomplish what? Peace and justice. Fascinating. He says, what kind of world do we want to build together? Are these people builders? Are they building the Tower of Babel? Very interesting. This question leads us to think of people and of persons rather than capital. And what we must solve is environmental degradation. Has someone said that the future is spiritual? Oh, yes. And even before that, from moral degradation. If you read the book, Great Controversy, page 588 and 589, you will see that people will cry out for Sunday observance because there's moral degradation in society. These are the key words. And he says we could even say that the good, if it is not the common good, is not actually good. You know what made Jesus to be crucified? It's the philosophy of the common good. You remember in, John, in the Gospel of John, the religious leaders are standing up and say, it is better for one person to die than for the whole nation. That's very interesting. Are things happening again? So the document, in its essence, as you can see, it's about solving the problems of our contemporary world it's about doing everything possible except preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so it is a guide for future generations to advance tolerance, to advance all of these issues. And so we need to have dialogue, cooperation. And here it comes. The document call upon the leaders of the world the architects of international policy and world economy. Have we, have we missed someone? Is everyone there? The leaders, the architects of international policy, world economy, in other words, everyone to work strenuously to spread the culture of tolerance and of living together in you see, it's not the peace that you and I think of. Pope Francis says that we, if you want to understand the document, go to the Second Vatican Council. Peace is what? It's found in the common good who found it in the eternal law. Fascinating. It is about environmental decay and moral and cultural decline that the world is presently experiencing. According to the document, we must rediscover the values of peace. Do you see how they are using keywords? Justice as anchors of salvation. What is Roman Catholic view of salvation? Not only preaching the gospel, but it includes the changes of the whole temporal 
order. You saw the quote. So Pope Francis himself explains these values in another address in Dubai. He says, justice is the second wing of peace, which often is not compromised by single episodes, but is slowly eaten away by the cancer of injustice. Peace and justice are inseparable, he says. Peace dies when it is divorced from justice. But justice is false if it is not universal. So by rediscovering the values of peace and justice, he basically means that the solutions to the economical degradation and the environmental degradation and the moral decay must be universal in and of itself. And my brothers and sisters, we are not, uh, not against peace. Please understand that. We are not against justice in and of itself. But we, with the eyes of prophecy, we know where this is headed. We can jump over this. In the document, fascinatingly enough, they say, the family is the fundamental nucleus of society. And humanity is essentially essential in bringing children into the world. If you have been focusing and if you have been researching how the Sunday law proponents in Europe are arguing, they are using the family. They are using the family. That people are not spending time with each other. And so let's have a day of rest where families can spend time with each other. The Islam and Christianity are founding common grounds in which they can later develop their foundations. And this is how it ended, the document. This is what we hope and seek to achieve with the aim of finding a what kind of peace? That all can enjoy in this life. How do they enjoy that? If they discover the eternal law. Who will give that law? <laughs> Who will be the one that will come as Noah? Unite the human family into the ark of brotherhood. Can you see prophecy getting more and more excited? Can you see how the prophetic bits which we may not have understood, how it is all falling into place. Now there are certainly more steps that will come, but we see the very beginnings of these movements. And so you, you ask the question, Sebastian, why have you pulled this sermon? Of all the sermons you can talk about, why this? Well, let me give you two, two reasons. The first is, I believe Jesus is coming soon. Amen. And I believe that we must understand what is taking place in our world. In order that if there are people around us, we may give them guidance so that they may have answers to their questions. I believe Jesus is indeed coming back very soon. And my brothers and sisters, I do not say this to make you afraid. I do not say this to, to make you anxious. I say this because your, yours and my Savior, your very best friend, is indeed coming back. And who knew that the prophecies in the Bible and in the book Great Controversy would actually fulfill in our lifetime? Amen. I believe that we are that generation Amen. that will see Jesus come. And what a joy it will be to see Him and to look Him into His face. And he will tell you, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into the joy. So my brothers and sisters, we see these events not as something to make us afraid, but to make us joyous because Jesus is coming back. We are not focusing on the crisis, we are focusing on the Christ. However, we must understand the crisis. Because the Bible says that the deception will be so big in the end times that even the very elect may even be deceived. That's the first point. Jesus is coming back soon. And the second point is, people need to know this very message. 
In that wonderful book, Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 386, it says, This contest is to decide whether the pure gospel shall have the field in our nation, or whether the popery of past ages shall receive the right hand of fellowship from Protestantism. And this power prevailed to restrict religious liberty. Now it comes. The message must go what? Broadcast. That those, listen to this, that those who have been imperceptibly tempering with popery, not knowing what they were doing, that they may hear. If we will not say anything, who will? And I believe that many of these leaders who are joining with this movement, with this antitypical Noah, so to speak, they don't know what they are doing. They are simply deceived. They don't have that prophetic insight which you and I have. And I believe that those who see, search the truth and who want to know the truth, when they will hear this message go broadcast, they will accept the truth. But if we will not preach, who will? They are fraternizing with popery by compromises and by concessions which surprise the adherents of the papacy. So what have we been talking about? We have seen that people are asking questions. We have seen that there is a political revolution taking place where the liberal world, or world order is swinging into a conservative world order. We see that uh, the climate change agenda is going forward where some of the proponents are even saying that we must have a spiritual revolution if we will do anything. We have seen in scripture where the Bible says that all the world will wonder after the papacy and I have just shown you how Islam is, is getting into that very, very place which you and I have believed in but have never understood how that would actually take place. We have seen that there are two key words that they are using, peace and justice. And that peace is nothing else than the common good to find it in the eternal law. Our, my question to you is, who are we going to follow? Are we going to follow the beast? Or are we going to follow the Lamb? Will we listen to the traditions of men? Or will we listen to the words of God? It is my prayer for each one of us. Stay faithful. Stay faithful to Jesus. Yes, times will come. But you know what? It is not in our power that we go through the last days. It is only by the grace of God and the power of God that gives us that victory which we sang about just before this presentation. I wish you God's richest blessings as we are entering upon what I believe is the final act, the final phase of Bible prophecy. And my brothers and sisters, soon, soon, very soon, we are going home.